Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order of the Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board, October 4th, 2022, 5 p.m. And we have a motion to approve tonight's agenda, please. Scott Anderson, motion to approve. Dave Bossy, second. Motion is made by Scott Anderson, seconded by Dave Bossy to approve tonight's agenda. All in favor, Mr. Brace? Aye. Mr. Payer? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Mr. Bossy? Aye. Chair votes aye. Do we have Ginger on board? Not yet. Okay. So far, we've got uh, Tara and then I'll wait there with Ginger. Right. Draft minutes, September 20th, 2022. Has everybody had a chance to review them? Are there any revisions? I have a revision addition to the green crab part. So I brought up uh, <coughs> about the distiller we're looking after is using green crabs as part of the process. I am going to pursue looking into that distillery aspect a little more, but just I would like that added. Okay. Any other revisions? If not, I'll accept a motion to approve tonight's minutes as revised. So moved, Mr. Chairman. This is Ginger. Thank you, Ginger. Do we have a second? Second by Scott Anderson. Motion is made by Ginger, seconded by Scott to approve the minutes of September 20th. All in favor, Mr. Brace? Aye. Mr. Payer? Aye. Mr. Anderson? Aye. Uh, Mr. Bossy, um, state, and Ms. Andrews. Aye. Your votes aye as well. Nothing under Chairman's report tonight. Uh, Marine Department report. Sheila, please. Okay. Um, I'll just start out with um, telling you guys what we got done for the summer. So the lifeguards successfully guarded over 330,000 people on 10 guarded beaches and thousands more on unguarded beaches. We performed 179 rescues and assists. We provided preventative education to the public 30,000 times. Survived 75 shark sightings. Uh, and as far as the dock staff, we did 600 hours of underway for recreational boarding safety control, over 700 hours underway for pump ups, uh, 26,000 gallons to date. We assisted six boats taking on water, responded to over 60 calls for assistance. We're still on the beaches on ATVs until uh, Monday. Uh, and, but, you know, weather dependent at this point. Uh, we are, the dog staff is pretty much all, pretty much gone. Um, everybody went back to school. So um, we are starting the project at the town pier. Starts on, on I think the 17th um, is the date that we have to have everybody off the pier and, and ready to go. The first part of the project is going to be to um, extend that dog leg, which is going to come on another 100 feet, which should provide us really good uh, protection for the floating dock and the fixture as well. It's also going to give us a few more slips. Um, and then the second phase will be to uh, replace the floating docks. As of right now, we have only one floating dock that needs to be repaired, but this weather is absolutely killing us because six days of the same direction in the same seas, it just tires the equipment out together with the band aid as it is. So, um, right now we're just walking up and down, crossing our fingers. We have had a lot of damage around um, the island with this blow. We have three boats, like half sunk. We have um, four boats up on the beach. We have uh, we got some damage out to the um, docks at our dock, the town docks at um, F Street. Um, minor, I think, you know, something we could quickly repair. We sustained some damage on our dinghy docks. Um, so, but the problem is we got another 24 hours of this, at least. 
So I'm just hoping that we get everything. Uh, just pray until we get through this. Um, we still, all the navigation is still in the water. The intent is to keep the uh, no wakes in, but that no wakes all will be enforced year round. And I uh, intend on meeting with the ferries again this year to remind them of that. That even when I haul the buoys out, the reason we're going to haul the buoys out is if we get an icy winter, they're expensive and they'll go with the ice. So we'll haul it out, but we will enforce. And they they are understanding that. And they, they did really good last one to where we when we spoke home about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we were crazy busy all summer, but you know. I think we did a pretty good job and um, the crews all worked super hard but left pretty happy and felt pretty good about it. The, um, we were one of the only places that did not have a lifeguard issue. Um, most of the country was suffering through a problem and ended up having 160 applicants for 60 spots. Cool. So, um, and it's because they're they're recruiting within themselves and they go back to school. And I think our recruiting efforts are, are really good. And so we're gonna keep going with that again. Um, you know, you know, I'd say 70% of the kids that were here want to come back next year. So and we'll just keep doing everything we can to keep improving the program. Um, but yeah. The, the biggest next biggest thing for us is just closing everything up, getting everything out of the water. The head hunter is done. I'm just waiting to get it on the ferry, but we still provide pump outs at the end of our pier. The boat base is still provide them at the end of their pier. Um, and we've been doing pretty well with that. Die tap program went really, really well. Um, I can give you a number. I've meant to get a four game, but um, I can give you a number of taps that we did hand out. Everybody was really good about it. Uh, and we pushed it out on social media quite a bit. So um, we, we intend to continue with that because they've had other groups come and say that they want to help fund it. And as long as we do it, you know, and it's it's no trouble for us. We're out there all the time anyways. Um, so we just, we just go boat to boat and hand them out. Um, and the boat base was really cooperative as was in Tuck Moorings. So um, everybody's on board with it. As uh, the boat basin, uh, I'm sure we'll handle anybody that would have normally been at the town pier. Uh, uh, yeah. The pier will be closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Did they offer any, uh, you know, any? We haven't really talked about it yet. Huh? Um, I'm more talking to her about um, posting our floating docks. Uh, so, yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, all the guys. Pretty much now, um, and obviously I won't kick them till the last possible second, mm -hmm. you know. And if if the guys on the if they're working on the fixed pier and they say that they you know they don't care about the floating dock for another two weeks, then we'll leave them there as long as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Their leases are up on September thirtieth, anyways. So um, any time they get after that is is great. Mm -hmm. Does the boat basin, uh, will they be having construction again this year? Yep, they'll be having construction again this year. Which wow. portion? Um, do you know? I don't know. I I don't They seem to, to be working their way from north exactly. to south. Yep. Okay. Board members, questions for Sheila? Comments? Um, oh, last thing. The lottery. <clears throat> the lottery will be on the last Friday at noontime at 34 Washington Street. It's only for the one year slips this year. Last year we did both A and B. This year it's just B, which is a one year slip. So we have 40 recreational slips and um, five commercial B slips. Were there any incidents uh, with boats running into the jetties? Yeah, we had a few, but a few go up on the jetties this year, but operator error completely. Yeah was the reason the jetties both times that significant boats went up were well 
it was well exposed. Mm -hmm. It's just dark, <laughs> unfamiliar. Yeah. Um, one boat came from Madicate, it was a local. Really? So, too bad. There's a boat on the marsh. You, you're coming from Walwyn, and you get that glimpse of Pulpus Harbor past Jane Lamb's house. It's the one that says Chaos Corner on it. So you're headed toward town, and then you can see the harbor. And way up in the marsh, there's a boat that looked like the center console, maybe. Boat. Okay, I'll go take a look at that. I did not know about that one. It's hard. You wouldn't see it if you went to one of the two landings. Because that's where we did go today to see what we had going on there. And then it was something on the at the end of Pulpus Harbor Road. Uh, there was underwater. It was like red. I don't know whether it was a just a robot, just just a skiff, but well, yeah. What the once the wind calms down, I can usually get a better idea when we cruise around by boat. Yeah. And see see what happened. But right now we're just doing it by vehicle just because it's not fun to be on the boat. Right sure. Now. Yeah. And how, how's all your equipment and your boats so and yeah you know, feeling good it's with it's your good. I mean I'm, we're trying to uh, like I'm asking for a new engine especially for the buoy boat we both could use one problem is is like there's a production backup mm -hmm. like everything else mm -hmm. with you know everybody blaming everything on COVID but I I believe them yeah so there's so we're in the queue for that that and that engine owes us nothing it's a 2007 Wow. And um, we've had it on three different boats. Wow. So we, nice. we've been getting our money's worth. We've been, we, we take good care of our stuff and could use that, we could use a new truck. Uh, but again, we ordered that and that hasn't come through. So you know, is, is, is your barn in cooperation now? No, 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 that's still. I, and I guess the problem with that is maybe some local contractors that are like behind. And uh, so our job is just keeps getting pushed back. Uh, I would love to wish that that would be available for this winter, but I don't think it's going to be. Because that's the perfect place to work on it. Mm -hmm. But it's permitted and, and capable yep, of groundbreaking. Yep, yep. No, so no foundation. That way. That, that's not the problem. I think it's more getting people to get out there and get the job done. We needed to get some plumbing put in and some stuff like that going on. Hopefully it'll get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't mind working in the cold, but it's so much better if just the wind's not on. Mm -hmm. You know, like where we've been working on those floating docks last four winters is like right there on travel with way in the wind going down there until mm -hmm. it's killed you. You know, I, I we're all pretty tough and we can handle the cold. It's just wind on you. Sure. So even if we just had a shelter, just to yeah. knock the wind out. And the uh, office building. What's what's the latest? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. I know that every, they got the money and everything's been approved, and I know all that type of stuff has been done. Contract is selected. I don't know. I guess yeah. it was a problem with the architect. They haven't really shared all that with me. I just know that it's supposedly good to go when it's good to go. And um, but I said, should I stop moving stuff out? Because I wanted to stop moving stuff out. Well, I had a bunch of hands to help me mm -hmm. stop moving stuff out. And they were like, don't stop that yet. So. Okay. Is a temporary office prepared for you? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know what? I, I'll get better. In, I'll get you better numbers for the die tap, and I'll get you better info about the the two buildings, like where we stand with those. Okay. Thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. Nothing else from board members? Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So you just um, reach out to the uh, member of the public who's. <clears throat> Screen name is E. Antoinetti. Could you um, respond to the uh, chat on your screen asking you to give me your full name for the minutes? There you go. Thank you. Natural Resources Report. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. Yep. Um, so since it's been a while, I have a bit to report about the summer. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. So we had a lot of tours this summer. It was the first summer since COVID that we've been open um, to the public. We had around 400 people tour the hatchery from June to August on our regularly uh, scheduled public tours. Um, in addition, we also had the Nantucket Boys and Girls Club come through the hatchery um, Tara, during the week of Tara, their- I'm sorry. Tara, let me just interrupt you just for a minute. Uh, Sheila needs has another engagement to make. Uh, I'd just like to ask the public if there's any comment for on uh, Marine Department report. Not seeing or hearing any. Sheila, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and I. Thank you. Thank you. Tara, forgive me for that. Thank you. Please continue. Yeah, no worries. Um, I was just saying that we um, had the Boys and Girls Club, um, which is the largest camp on the island um, for local kids, come through the hatchery um, during the entire eight weeks of camp. We got each grade to come through and learn about what we were doing. And in addition, the kids that were too young to travel to the hatchery we went to them at the Boys and Girls Club every week and brought lessons to them so that they didn't miss out on, uh, on what we were doing either. Uh, they learned about the scallop fishery and scuba diving. Um, we did some fun science crafts and um, brought touch tanks to them. Um, we also had various interest groups come through the hatchery and other camps um, that inquired about tours via email that we fit into our schedule. Um, so basically nobody was turned away as far as um, tours go. So we were able to kind of have an open door policy, which was nice. Um, for collaborations this summer, we worked with the Great Harbor Yacht Club's Youth Foundation um, and provided some of the young members and a few local island students um, with a week long deep dive into what we do. We had about seven to 10 kids help us for a week um, and learn the importance of our work. They also had requ required reading and a presentation to complete by the end of the week, um, which they presented at the, the Great Harbor Yacht Club. We worked with um, one of our former interns, Noah Singer, who is a new student for Boston University in their graduate program. Um, he, he worked for the land council this summer and uh, worked on a eelgrass project where we assisted him with um, harvesting, processing, and storing 300,000 eelgrass seeds for planting in Monomoy and also a site up in Fifth Bend. Um, we were able to provide the divers, the boats, and the tank space to assist with the project. Um, and in addition to the seed planting, Boston University students came down to assist NOAA in transplanting around 4,000 eelgrass plants in the fifth bend as well. Um, so that was fun. And a lot of those seeds are currently still in our tanks um, and they're going to be planted out, uh, let's see, next Monday and on the 17th. Um, so that then we'll be able to shut our tanks down for the winter. We also worked with NSA um, and monitored the large um, scallop set in uh, Madiket Harbor. Um, if you recall, it was a, a large seed set last, last year um, in the middle of Madiket and NSA decided to move a portion of the scallop seed to spread it out. Um, and so what we did is we, when they moved the seed, we um, GPSed it and then we monitored it throughout the summer. Each month we went and we either scuba dived or snorkeled, collected scallops, looked over all the, the entire area um, to monitor for health and growth. Um, and survival rates. And uh, basically the results for that are that the moves were successful um, as far as survival rates go. 
don't think there was a lot of mortality associated with it. So there are, there are good reasons to move seed. Um, as far as growth of the seed that was moved, it remained relatively the same as the scallops that weren't moved. So, you know, I think there's some strategies that we can employ based on the reason it is that we're moving the seed, you know, for moving it to get out of harm's way if it's going to get stranded or if we're moving it because we want to create spawning populations in different areas. Um, I think the move that we did was successful for those reasons. But if we're moving it to improve growth rates of, you know, the population, then I think there's some different strategies that we need to employ and some different care that we need to give while the seed is, is being moved as far as like, you know, taking time to spread it out more and that sort of thing. Um, the reason being is because all of the, the scalps and maticate are really thick and dense, which is great for, you know, people just wanting to harvest scallops. But if you look at the details of it, we opened up a bushel in, let's see, it was probably a month ago, we harvested a bushel and it was around four and a half pounds per bushel. So that's really low. Um, and that's indicative of just how dense the population is and how much they were competing for food uh, throughout the summer. So, so there's that, um, but it was a good effort. And, you know, I think that it's something that we need to look at um, if we continue to do that in the future. All right, so events that NRD worked this summer, we worked the Cisco Trash and Show and the NSA Oyster Fest. Um, from an educational standpoint, we gave talks, um, the Land Council State of the Harbor event, and then the Great Harbor Yacht Club also hosted a smaller State of the Fishery event, um, which we gave talks at as well. Um, so the hatchery we shut down in August and we've moved our focus to uh, you know, the field. So surveying shellfish stocks, habitat and making plans for the, the fishery season. Um, our production numbers are still under evaluation, but the hatchery did hit its yearly production goal. Um, and we were able to expand on various types of stock enhancement for bay scallops. Our release sites for this year were in Second Bend, Shimo Bend, and Fourth Bend. Um, we grew out a certain amount of post set bay scallops, which means when we release um, larvae, they're like 10 to 14 days old. But we also grew out a certain number of scallops from each spawn that we conducted this year. So we, um, we would set those in the hatchery and grow them to a larger size and then continue growing them in spat bags out in the harbor till they're about usually dime size or quarter sized. And then we brought those back to the hatchery, counted them, processed them, and then all of those went into third bend. Um, so that was a really good strategy um, to get scallops to a larger amount. And so we're still kind of refining that process and trying to figure out how we can improve on that um, because that's a lot easier to quantify than releasing larvae into the harbor. Um, Cohogs this year, we grew, that was our first spawn of the season. We grew them in our outdoor flow through system. Um, we're currently holding a portion of them. We're gonna stock them out probably on Friday. We already put some out around um, Fulling Mill, Pacmo Point, and Monomoy. And we're trying to target areas that are accessible from land um, and away from the main mooring field uh, so that you know, we can avoid some of the closures that we've been having. Uh, the remaining clams that we have in our system are gonna go out to Maticot on Friday. And so one of the things we do to, to monitor the natural spawns is we put out spat bags every season, every two weeks throughout May through the end of October. And what that does is, you know, a certain amount of the natural spawns and scallops will settle on these bags that are floating in the harbor. 
Um, and it's a way for us to monitor what is naturally going on in the harbor as far as spawns and recruitment go. It's also a way for us to monitor some of our research. If we do larval releases, we use these spat bags as well. Um, the hot spot for this year for recruitment in Madikit was Little Neck. Um, so there's a lot of seed over there. And um, also in Nantucket Harbor, the hot spots remain up in the head of the harbor. It's just kind of, you know, where everything accumulates just due to circulation patterns. Um, so what we've been doing is collecting all of the spat that recruits up there in the bags, bringing it back to the hatchery, counting it, processing, and then putting it in different locations throughout Nant Nantucket Harbor. Um, on Friday, we just finished our two weeks of dive surveys for Nantucket Harbor. So that includes, we did 39 sites for that survey, and then we did an additional 10 sites for the hatchery. Um, but what that does is there are underwater dive surveys we've done since 2006. They look at habitat, shellfish stocks, and sediment changes over time. Um, this survey is really essential to identify trends and changes um, over time for management of the fishery and the habitat and for planning large scale projects such as dredge, dredging and uh, sediment transport. Um, so the results so far, these take a while to process and analyze everything and compare it to previous years. But since we were obviously the ones doing the dives in underwater, you know, you get a, a a sneak peek at kind of what's going on. Um, and so some preliminary, um, you know, observations include that there's a ton of seed all along the South shore, mainly off of the field station and Fulling Mill. Um, I anticipate that that seed is gonna have to be moved very soon. Um, it's right kind of on the perimeter of where the eelgrass meets the sand um, that goes to shore. So. It's not that it's close into shore, but it's that the eelgrass is very short there. Um, so the holding capacity is very low. Um, and so I anticipate that will be, you know, pretty vulnerable to strandings. Um, we were out there on Friday checking it out and I'm interested to get back in and check it out after this wind and see, you know, if anything has changed, but it's something that we need to talk to NSA about and get some people in the water and moving some seed probably pretty soon um, before we get some more storms. Um, as far as adults go, they were most abundant. Again, these are just like, these surveys are a snapshot of the harbor at, you know, basically 40 different sites. So it's not, you know, saying that, you know, this is the only place where there's seed or adults, but during our surveys, the adults were most abundant in fourth bend, second bend, and kind of along that spit between fourth bend and fifth bend, um, just off of Pacamo. Um, the lingbia, which is a macroalgae, um, an invasive algae, appeared to be lighter and absent in a lot of the spots that we have recorded it before, which was great to see. Um, it was present in some new areas. So that part of the analysis will be really interesting to to kind of tease out what's going on in, in the areas where it disappeared from and the areas where, where it has newly appeared. Um, so those were the surveys. Now um, on to opening day of the fish <coughs> started October 1st for base scalloping. The weather has been, as you know, pretty crappy. Um, wind has not been favorable for pleasant scalloping, but despite that, people have been going out um, we started a volunteer monitoring program in Madikit to try and get an idea and gauge what is coming out of Madikit just because there is there are so many scallops um, in that area. And um, we used to be able, when you got your recreational permit, you would fill out a form that said, you know, basically what you harvested the previous year. And when the permitting went to the police station, that form disappeared and kind of went away. So we have no way to gauge what people are harvesting from a recreational standpoint. So we are putting something in place for that for the next season when you go to apply for your permit. But for right now, we are depending on volunteers and our staff to kind of 
at least for the month of October and part of November to, to help us get that information um, during low tide of, of what's coming out of Madiket. Um, most of the seed is in the middle of Madiket on the other side of the channel, but it is accessible if, if you know how to, to get there. Um, and, you know, I think if you can get there either by boat or using your waders, you can get a bushel in 20 minutes. Um, as far as like, you know, scallops and other areas of Madiket, I think it's gonna take a little bit longer, but there is stuff closer into shore that was moved by NSA and also stuff that, that is there naturally. Um, and then I think that's it for right now. I know that was a lot of information. You know, right now is the time of year where we're closing everything down and we're kind of going through our reports and getting all our information together and assembling it so that we can make sense of it. Um, we have a lot of meetings. Um, we're working on the Harbor Plan Implementation Committee and basically the formation of the revision committee. I think we requested that one of the SHAB members volunteer for that. Um, but we have had about three preliminary meetings with um, the, the company that is helping us um, revise that plan. And we've had some, some good talks about um, the past Harbor plan. We met with Sarah Octe, who has uh, played a huge role in, in drafting the last one. Um, and so we met with her to kind of go through the matrix from the last one and, and see where we're heading. Um, Coastal resilience was not even mentioned in the previous plan. Um, so there's a lot of updates that need to happen and be modernized um, with, you know, what's currently going on on Nantucket. Um, so that's a lot of like where our focus is heading. Um, our water quality uh, position, um, Thais, she's out on maternity leave. So we've been filling in and doing a lot of the water quality sampling for her, which includes getting ready to open the ponds in a few weeks and making sure the samples and the tide gauges are in place for that to monitor the drop in the ponds. Um, so we've been kind of all over the island and all over the place. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer them. Um, our department has gotten very broad in their reach um, as far as, you know, what we're involved in. So I don't have answers to all of the questions and all of the projects that we're involved in, but I can find out the answers if you ask them or you want to email me. Um, but I'm happy to, to hear any questions and try my best to answer. Thank you, Tara. Board members. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Grace. <clears throat> um, so in the springtime, Tara, you guys were, um, well, with the help of the Shellfish Association, of course, moving seed from the from the cache in Madiket to various places. But at some point, you guys had to stop. Um, and so I'm just wondering how much was left in there, and and I'm just looking at the wondering the fate of those scallops. Are they all? crushed down on each other and not survive or they get scattered around or could you go in there and move more? I think, um, so NSA was able to move a thousand bushels in two weeks. And it was two weeks that NSA funded, you know, paid the scallopers to help do that. And it wasn't a function of the money running out or anything like that. It was a function of people just becoming yeah. exhausted. Um, by the effort because it was, there were so many scallops to move and it was such a big, big task. Um, the scallops that were left, um, you know, continued obviously to be dense. Um, some of them did get silted over, but all in all from everything that we've surveyed and done out there, I think everything looks good. I don't think things grew very well um, out there you know, just because they're so dense and they're competing for food and that sort of thing. It's just, you know, but there were not any mass die-offs or anything like that. Um, you know, I don't know what you do about that. You know, people are gonna be very happy that there's scallops to get, but they're also gonna complain because the weights are so small and the meats are small. So, you know, from a biological standpoint, you know, I was happy to see the scallops because I think it's good for spawning and recruitment and creating more scallops. 
Um, but from a fishery standpoint, they're easy to get, but you know, I don't, I don't know. It'll be really interesting to see for commercial season. I don't think recreational people care as much. They're just going to be happy they can get them. Um, but commercially it will be interesting to see if the guys, you know, what, what they have to say about it. I, I think that, I mean, Mr. Chairman, I still oh, sorry, some, Peter. I still have a couple more things. Sorry, Ginger. Um, I would think that, you know, after last season, people would be happy just to get some scallops and if they're small or small and, you know, the, you and the shellfish hatchery and the um, scalpers and the shellfish association, you, you've done an amazing job to get scallops back into areas where they can grow. Like scalpers can complain, they can come complain to us, but you know, you, you did what you could. Um, I just had two other things. Um, so do you anticipate moving seed from, you know, um, in front of the field station and quays before the scallop season or the commercial season? Um, I think personally, it, I think it needs to happen before the commercial season, but most guys probably don't have their boats in the water or maybe they're going to be in Madikit this year. So I'm going to meet with Sam from NSA and talk to her about it. Um, you know, maybe it will happen on, in November the first week when you know that people have their boats in the water and they can, you know, go scalloping in the morning, get their catch, and then maybe they can come out and move seed for an hour or something like that. Um, you know, I just don't know where people are at with that and how many people are going to be in Nantucket Harbor this year, but it's something, you, I mean, you know how the winds go in November um, and in the end of October. So it's just a matter of time and I much rather move them now than pick them up off the beach. Um, and then just one more thing, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, um, do you do you foresee a, a, a stranding for the you know wind we've had for basically the last five days? Um, and if so, oh, you, I definitely think about like the direction and and where the strandings could occur, where the scallops you know could end up. And we were talking about Pimneys and Abrams um, and that sort of thing, but you know, based on the surveys and everything, I'm, I wasn't too concerned about this wind. Um, but I am concerned if it, you know, changes direction and blows for three more, you know, three more days or something like that, that would be pretty bad. All right. Thank you. Yep. So Ginger. thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really great that the, the was so much in Madikett. Um, and I, and obviously, uh, I get, well, I guess the, the, the com competition for food is, is an obvious thing to look at. I was wondering if there was any, um, uh, anything, um, uh, possibly, uh, like, uh, water temperature that might've affected things. And if you monitored that, or if, if you observed any, uh, changes, cause it's, we did have a, you know, a, a very long, uh, unusually hot spell in July, and I didn't know if the uh, water temperature where it's shallow might have reflected that. Yeah, we did monitor the water temperatures. Um, they are, you know, different. They can be very different in Madikit Harbor. Um, just for an example, Eel Point tends to be a lot cooler than, you know, areas closer to, to Hither Creek and inshore. Um, I didn't really notice anything different as far as growth rates in all of those areas, but it is something to consider. I think like doing some, you know, just some simple studies of putting scallops in different areas of the harbor and seeing where they grow best at like a normal density so that we know, you know, if we do want to move them for growth reasons, where a good place would be, um, I, we monitored the water temperature because of what's going on in um, Peconic Bay where they're having mass die-offs of scallops at, at the higher temperatures in the summer. And it's something that I worry about, but we didn't, you know, I think the highest recorded temperature we had in Madikit was 78, but I did not see any mass die-offs or see anything like that during our, our later surveys that we did. Um, 
We moved stuff out to Tucker Neck, which we only made it out there once. Um, and obviously that's like a completely different animal out there, but stuff did grow very well, but it was very hard to find because the eel grass was so mm. thick there. Um, but yeah, those are all important things to consider with the temperature and the food. I think in general, there was a lot of weird things going on this year. Um, Nantucket Harbor seemed very, very clear the entire summer. Um, although things were growing, it just seemed like there wasn't a ton of food in the water, which I thought was like pretty odd. Mm. I, it was probably maybe related well, to the rain that we had and nutrients going in the water. Wow. Well, thank you, Tara. Yep. Board members. Did the FDA ever show up? The FDA did not show up. Um, we, I don't know if I talked to you guys about the sampling problem that we had with the DMF when they came out. Um, they did the sampling um, in the morning fields and at the hatchery because we're trying to um, change the lines on those um, so that, you know, you, you can go clamming year round. Also the hatchery being an improved area. And they showed up and did sampling in a very erratic way and didn't um, take temperature samples with the fecal coliform samples. And they ended up failing our hatchery and we had a huge problem with it, of course, and called them on it. And they agreed that they needed to come back and resample, but it really just like, I lost all my confidence in what they're trying to do or if they're even trying to help us. So, you know, it's a constant thing that we're, we're trying to have a conversation with um, the DMF. And then, um, you know, the DMF is kind of the next tier before the FDA. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's a tricky relationship. Um, but yes, I think uh, the, the FDA did not come down and take a look at what we were doing. Tara, what is the temperature threshold for scallop die off that, uh, that would concern you? I, I mean, mean I, go ahead. I think anything, I mean, it's, not uncommon that we hit 78 um, in the head of the harbor. And sometimes I think that we've even gone higher, like 80. Um, but I think it's just like the prolonged um, time at a temperature greater than 78 is something that I would worry about. Okay. Um, and when, when, the, uh, when the eelgrass does its uh, uh, natural thinning process, so to speak. Um, and you see a lot of eelgrass wash up with root system attached onto the beaches. Uh, is, is, this, is that eelgrass worthy of being collected and replanted? Um, absolutely. I mean, if the temperatures are right and you can collect it, um, according to the eelgrass people we've been working with, you have like 48 hours before it needs to be back in the water and planted and it needs to be kept either in like a flow through tank or it needs to be kept cool um, so it doesn't start to degrade. Um, I think this time of year with the wind you see a lot more eelgrass kind of uproot but you also this is the time of year where people are taking their boats in the moorings out so you also see more of that on shore and just from these surveys the amount of I would say dead eelgrass and rack line that we came across, like even in the middle of the harbor, it was so thick. So, you know, seeing that sort of thing wash up, like I, I don't, I don't know how old that eelgrass is, but I was surprised to see it in the middle of the harbor. And I'm always concerned when I see it on shore, but now, you know, I know that it's already in the harbor and it's probably just been sitting there for a long time. So when it washes up, I might not be as concerned, but definitely when you see the fresh green and the roots, that's something that, that is concerning. I, I was just curious uh, if uh, kind of like a seed stranding program, if, if, if boots happen to be on the ground in an area and you notice uh, if, if it's noticed by somebody, if, if it's worth, uh, giving a call and trying to uh, 
trying to salvage some of it uh, to, to be replanted. It, it usually happens every August. And, yeah, and I think if you can get in the water, you know, before the end of October, because this is October 17th is the last time that the eelgrass team is coming out. And just from personal experience, I know that, you know, you, if you don't have a dry suit on it, it you know, you're kind of approaching the threshold of, of being comfortable in the water. Um, mm -hmm. So I think like there's a limitation to, you know, the stuff that washes up in the winter, you just, you just don't have the staff to deal with it. Um, yeah. Um, has the department rigged a scallop boat? We have a scallop boat. It is not rigged. Um, we have a lot of the parts for hauling dredges um, that just need to be installed. But that is a, a situation that we are trying to address because obviously we do have a staff member that that knows how to do that sort of thing. And we're just trying to work that into the schedule so that we can be independent and move seed on our own without depending on NSA to do that. All right, and one last question from me, just uh, curious if uh, you've worked on a spat bag gear redesign considering the, the leather back incident. Um, we have not worked on a redesign. Um, we did talk to the turtle entanglement specialist from NOAA, and she said that she felt like having a turtle in the harbor is not very common. And um, she said currently there isn't any recommendations except for, I mean, we did talk about a few things, but there's nothing like a breakaway would not work for a turtle like it works for a whale with a lobster gear. Um, you know, we had talked about wrapping our line with vinyl hose on some of the longer lines that we have, and that could be one thing to help prevent entanglement, but she really didn't seem that concerned about our situation and what we were doing. Um, and that, you know, of course, we don't wanna be entangling turtles and, and causing problems with our gear, so you know, if they had told us that there was absolutely something that we needed to do, then we would do it. Um, but for right now, they didn't seem that concerned with the situation. So we just kind of consider ourselves lucky that the turtle was rescued. And, um, you know, we're out there almost every day, you know, checking on things and stuff like that. And we're lucky that the public is, you know, keeping an eye on it too so that we can respond um, in a timely way for that. Well, that's good. You were in full communication in response to it. So that's wonderful. Certainly seeing that footage had to be heartbreaking for you as well, I'm sure. And, and uh, definitely agree with it being a very isolated incident. So uh, in my years on the harbor, I've never seen a turtle in the harbor either. Um, so, and like you say, having other eyes out there, uh, is, is good as well. So thank you for sharing that, Tara. Board members, any other questions for natural resources? All right. Uh, public comment for natural resources, if any, unmute yourself if you wish to speak. Not seeing any, uh, we will move forward. To old business, green crabs. Something new, Mr. Anderson? <clears throat> Nothing new. I'm still looking into the uh, whiskey aspect. Mm -hmm. I'd like, I'd like to make a recommendation to take that out of old business. I'd like to move that into yeah. open arbors because, like, I, I've just started to look at this, and this is really a big deal um, in terms of uh, uh, eating shellfish eating, and cutting grass. Uh, we've got another thing I'd like to add to that is conch. I'm just starting to look at that with the different kinds of conch that, that eat the meat eaters and the grass eaters. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I just like to, I thought it really is the health of the harbor. So okay. I just kind of like to shift them and maybe um, maybe add conchs to that if that's okay with you. Okay. In general, things that are doing damage to our harbors besides humans. Mm -hmm. Tara, are you still with us? Yes. Yep. Um, has anybody been actively conch fishing? 
Um, no one has been actively conk fishing, although from personal communication, I think that is going to be restarted again. Um, okay. At oh, least good. from Matt is interested in doing it. I know he uses green crabs for his bait. Um, it hasn't been locally sourced green crabs in the past. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an opportunity there, but um, also I, I do know that green crabs should be some sort of management plan should be written into our harbor plan. So that's something that can be discussed moving forward. Um, Thank you, Tara. I have one other comment about, Mr. The, Anderson. about the green crab aspect. They don't just eat the eelgrass, they devour uh, shellfish. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Absolutely. that's yeah. the most scary part because all yeah. the fat and everything will get devoured. Right. They have, they do, not only do they eat, chew it, but they somehow in, take it through their gills. So they don't even have to like chew it, it's mm. just like filter them through them. Wow, interesting. I was interested in how many conch shells I see going down the harbor side that are beautiful. <laughs> and they're obviously new. I mean, they obviously haven't been rolling around the bottom and, and getting beat up on the shore for a while. So there's got to be quite a number of conch out there. Yeah. Um, part, part of our survey that we do yearly does include knobbed and channeled whelk as well. It's the only other shellfish that's included into the, the benthic survey. <laughs> And what are you noticing for population? Um, I mean, most of Nantucket Harbor has ch a channeled whelk population, whereas Madiket has a knobbed whelk population. Um, that's part of the analysis that you know needs to, to be compared and come out because it is a snapshot. A lot of the dives that we do aren't necessarily in areas where the conch hang out. Um, they tend to like the ledges and some of the deeper water. How about starfish? Lots of brittle stars. Um, something interesting, sorry to <laughs> go into this real quick, but um, there are a ton of juvenile black sea bass and in their guts were uh, tiny scallop seed. Wow, ooh, interesting. I've never, okay. I've never seen that many juvenile black sea bass in the harbor, There's, they're everywhere. Wow, very interesting, okay, because Back in the 70s and 80s, starfish, I can remember seeing starfish come in with uh, half bushel baskets full of starfish, which are uh, a predator to the scallop as well. And uh, back in, in those days, the conch was uh, on the predator list and scallopers, whenever a conch came up in the dredge, they'd uh, break the shell on a cleat on board and, and toss it back overboard, which uh, I believe would end up killing the fish but but uh uh it's nice that there's a market for them and it's nice to hear that uh somebody will be actively fishing again for them uh certainly a better way to get rid of them uh to take them out and and have them processed into a food than to simply uh eradicate so if there's nothing else on green crabs We'll move into Health of the Harbors, the Clean Water Coalition discussion. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Brace. I spoke to Emily Molden at your behest and um, asked, basically reported to her that we felt that we should not be an official part of that group. And then I noted that um, in the list of groups that have been reported in the media that we weren't included, as well as the natural resources department not included. And she said that was intentional. Okay. Um, and But she wants us to be involved, but that they are um, trying to, I guess, um, come up with the things that they're gonna focus on basically. And when they, when they need us, they'll come to us. Mm -hmm. And they would like to maybe come here and present. Um, but, you know, of course, they want to support, but they don't need us on, on their committee. Wonderful. Um, anything else from the board, from the board on the Clean what Water Coalition? Committee here? Clean Water Coalition. Clean, Clean, Water, Clean Water Coalition. It's bringing together um, all of the organizations that are working on trying to boost our water quality around the island. Okay. Thank you. Brand new. Anybody else? 
moving forward, stormwater runoff and harbor impacts. Chairman, I'm I'm going to volunteer to track that with the town, you know, where the town's going with that. So I'll keep on top of that. Thank you. Gosh, that's wonderful, Dave. And thank uh, you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Brace. Since we really don't have this on the agenda, but that stormwater runoff and harbor impacts is part of it. Uh, I submitted the quarterly report to the select board today. Mm -hmm. um, and Libby Gibson got back to me and said, thank you so much. And that was, this looks really helpful. So just right. let you know that our work, you know, that that was a good idea of all of us. Mm -hmm. Great, good to hear. Thank you for doing that, Peter. And uh, I'm sorry, Tara, if you didn't know, um, we decided to do calendar year quarterly reports and send them to the select board to just sort of keep them abreast of what we're doing so they're not in the dark. So that if we do, if we do an advisory, if we do our jobs and send an advisory to them, that they'll be prepared. So if you want, um, we can send that to you and I guess I'll send it to Sheila. That'd be great, thank you. Okay. Anything else, stormwater runoff and harbor impacts? I think every time uh, we get uh, rain like this, mm -hmm. uh, I discovered another street puddling over that I don't remember seeing it puddling over before. Uh, we've got a lot of infill development with no stormwater runoff or drainage system included in these developed lots. And uh, it's just more ending up in our streets, which uh, a lot of the streets go straight into the harbor. So hopefully uh, something, something positive comes from this. It's long overdue. And thank you, Mr. Bossy, for uh, uh, keeping track of it for us. If there's nothing else, we'll move forward to excessive lawn fertilizer use. Any updates, discussion, or new information? Keeping this in here, simply health of the harbor issue. Uh, if there's something new, any great idea somebody has to uh, encourage people to use uh, uh, more environmentally friendly. That would be wonderful, Mr. Miss uh, Andrews, please. Oh yeah. Um, well, we were talking about uh, in, increasing, uh, you know, native plant uh, lawn uh, cover, and I seem to recollect that the land council had a uh, a nice list of uh, you know native landscape things to encourage native plantings. Um, I I think. I got it. I'm not sure where I stashed it, but uh, it's sort of preaching to the choir in a way. So I was uh, thinking we should maybe think about how to get some of the information that already exists more uh, widely uh, out there. Mm -hmm. Good idea. All right. Maybe social media. Uh, Thank you, Ginger. Board members, any more discussion for excessive lawn fertilizer use? Thoughts, ideas? FDA shellfish taking prohibition in the mooring fields. Is this supposed to be under old business? I think it probably should be. We've always had it in health of the harbor. Uh, and is there anything new? on this we had tara tell us about it yeah yeah okay tell us nothing new <laughs> right so, so does right. that mean it remains closed seeing as they didn't show up well it opened when when did they open back up automatically the uh it, I, I think it opened 15th wasn't it it was yeah it might have been september 15th or september 1st i'll have to check and see on that one um, but yeah, everything's open for scalloping, regardless of any closures that take take place. Um, so, but but the clamming in the mooring field is open. Oh, good. Tara, while you're on quickly, uh, 
there's a lot of, it seems like a lot of oysters uh, are living freely, but near where oyster farmers uh, have their cages. Uh, I had just had a question uh, from somebody who had been walking the beach and ended up picking up some oysters and enjoying them at home, but they were concerned if they would uh, could possibly get in trouble by any of the farmers for picking up these uh, freely uh, just, uh, you know, oysters living in the shallows uh, outside of the cages. If it's not on the official oyster lease, they cannot get in trouble as long as the oysters are the minimum harvest size, which is three inches. Um, they can't take anything. The one thing I would caution about that some people do is that if people buy oysters um, from like a retail establishment and they don't get to them, like they sit in the fridge for a while, people do dump their oysters in the shallows of different harbors. I've seen piles of them in Madikit in places they don't make sense. And I would never take those oysters because I don't know how long they have been out of the water or have been in the water. And I think that's like a disease problem waiting to happen. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, thank you for well, sharing that. Can I ask one yes. more question, Sarah, about that? So on the shellfish license, the, the, the piece of paper you used to get says that, that oysters are part of that. You right. get a shellfish license and you can take oysters. So should should that your comments be qualified that someone who's picking up oysters that have gone rogue out of someone's farm should they have their license to be able to do that of their course permit? you need a regional license to be able to do that and i i know that um one of the oyster farmers over in pacamo does free plant and a lot of those oysters especially when they're small are subject to some tides and winds and wave actions and sometimes those bags or the free planted oysters do end up in areas that are not on the lease i mean i found to you know full bags and quays before of stuff that just has gone missing and usually what we do is we'll call the farmers and let them know that we found some bags and if they want them they can come get them and if they don't then they're either confiscated or you know if someone else finds them and they're harvestable they'll take them home and eat them thank you tara <laughs> uh, anything else in health of the harbors that the board would like to discuss we'll move forward to new business coastal resilience advisory board do we have an update mr brace yes so for our last meeting which was september 27th Vince Murphy, the Coastal uh, Coordinator, we may have a different title now, um, uh, announced us that we did not get the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management grant application, grant that we wanted um, to do the feasibility study for the um, protective berm um, that was going to run, that, we, that is in plan to run from like, um, Francis Street, pretty much all the way through town. So we're gonna we're gonna look at other options for that grant. That is not a grant to pay for the berm to be built. It's a feasibility study. We need to make sure everybody gets that. Um, we did a discussion of uh, the climate action plan, um, the history of it. Um, uh, the Sustainable Nantucket proposed. Um, that and got the got the select board to sign on and say yes we need to do this and it was created now um, um, now there's an effort to redo that to, to revise it to bring it up to um, bring it up to modern you know up to 22 22 standards um, and have it mesh with the current coastal resilience plan um, we get an update from Vincent on coastal projects that are that are are being pursued now. Um, um, I guess Vincent called them quick projects. Um, projects like raising the road at um, potentially raising the road or doing a bridge at uh, between Fulcher's Marsh, the uh, south side and the north side, um, raising the road. Uh, starting before first bridge and going all the way to uh, second bridge 
um, and then dealing with Millie's Bridge. All of those things are going to happen in the near term. Um, so he was updating us on on, on that. Uh, that's pretty much it that I got for it. Oh, and I told um, in that meeting, whenever we meet, then one of the things that's on regular business is um, updates from the various people who represent the boards that are on the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee. So I, I, my report was that we're doing these quarterly reports and um, they, Vincent said he'd like to have the report sent to him. Great. So that's it. Thank you, Peter. And I'll just add that the Shellfish Association uh, has not met since our last meeting. The next NSA meeting is next Tuesday at 5.15. So uh, I'll have an update of what's happening at the NSA at our next meeting. Public questions or comments? Anything uh, the board would like to add to our agenda for the next meeting or anything you'd like to review of tonight's meeting? Just uh, Vince Murphy, you talked about here. Yep. Is he the one involved with oyster reefs? No. Vince is the coastal coordinator. He's all about um, guiding the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee for which this board, I'm a representative, I'm on that committee. Okay. So he's all about um, enacting the recommendations, um, the 40 recommendations in that plan and guiding us. So the people you should speak with about the oyster reef in Pulpus Harbor um, is Tara Riley, um, who's- That girl. Yep. And, um, me. and also the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. And so you understand the Conservation Foundation is a private entity that owns about 9,500 acres in the island. Oh. The Nantucket Conservation Commission is the regulatory commission that regulates and protects our wetlands for the town. So you would find a person there at the Conservation Foundation named Jen Carberg. She's sort of the person that was leading that project. And um, also the person who, um, is all about oysters in addition to Miss Riley is Leah Cabral, or it's Leah Hill now. Am I right in all that, Tara? Thank you. You're correct. I guess everybody's heard of this uh, glacier. I think it's in the Antarctic South Pole, the size of Florida, that's about to break off and raise sea level two feet. I can't quite believe that, but. <laughs> That's quite a bit. <laughs> and then attached to it are other parts of glaciers that will begin to crumble. So this whole thing about rising sea levels may yeah. accelerate faster than people anticipated. Undoubtedly. And I think if, if there's any hope in building oyster reefs <laughs> to come back, that we better get about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that. I'll have to look that up. Florida sized. Yeah, if you yeah, Florida sized glacier, you know, it'll pop up. Wow. Mm. It's amazing. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else, I'll accept a motion to adjourn before doing so. I'll just announce that our next meeting is October 18th, and after that, November 1st. Yeah, I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. I'll second. Second. Okay, right. two seconds. Uh, the motion's been made by Mr. Anderson, seconded uh, by Mr. Payer to adjourn tonight's meeting. All in favor, Mr. Brace. Aye. Ms. Andrews. Aye. I'm Mr. Payer. Aye. Mr. Anderson. Aye. Mr. Bossy. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Tara. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Ginger. Has everybody read the book On the Beach?